Hi, everyone. This is Luke Johnson. Today, I'm joined with Dr. Jonathan Cook for our fourth installment of Herman Melville's Battle Pieces of the Civil War. We're going to continue our discussion of, oh, I'm sorry, Battle Pieces and Aspects of the, of the War. I get that a little confused because I'm doing this massive uh, project where I'm recording the Battles and Leaders of Civil War primary text. But we're going to be going through a number of poems that we have yet to cover uh, and Dr. Cook, why don't you start us with the first in order of chronology? Yeah, so um, we're, we're going to be doing poems that are both uh, written about toward the end of the war, things that are happening at the end of the war, and then a, col- a selection from uh, the second part of Battle Pieces, which was called Verses Inscriptive and Memorial, which are some of them are shorter um kind of verbal epithets or i'm 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 sorry epitaphs on uh fallen soldiers at different battles so uh, and and the longest poem in that selection is the scout towards aldi which we we talked about a while ago um but anyway we're going to start with the frenzy in the wake which is a poem about sherman's march uh up the coast after he marched to the sea uh, in Georgia, and then he headed north through the Carolinas, uh, wreaking havoc uh, in the south. So the frenzy in the wake, Sherman's advance through the Carolinas, February 1865. That's the title of the poem. So strong to suffer, shall we be weak to contend and break the sinews of the oppressor's knee that grinds upon the neck? Oh, the garments rolled in blood, scorch in cities wrapped in flame, and the African, the imp, he gibbers, imputing shame. Shall time, avenging every woe, to us the joy allot, which Israel thrilled when Sisera's brow showed gaunt and showed the clot? Curse on their foreheads, cheeks, and eyes, the northern faces true to the flag we hate, the flag whose stars like planets strike us through. From frozen Maine they come, far Minnesota too, they come to a sun whose rays disown, may it wither them as the dew. The ghosts of our slain appeal, vain shall our victories be, but back from its ebb the flood recoils, back in a whelming sea. With burning woods our skies are brass, the pillars of dust are seen, the live-long day their cavalry pass, no crossing the road between. We were sore deceived, an awful host, they move like a roaring wind. Have we gamed and lost, but even despair shall never our hate rescind. So... Man, this is you know, this is one we could take a while to discuss. There's a lot in this poem. Well, it, it's a representative poem of the, the voice of the South, uh, which is not that common, right? So Melville is taking time away from his usual tone, which was, you know, commemorating Union victories or defeats, but clearly advocating for the cause of the Union. This is uh, showing the the human impact of the um, mass destruction of Sherman's armies marching, you know, this huge swath of territory which they they destroyed everything and it's you know burning and taking um all the cattle and whatnot you know living off the land pretty much so the the poem pretty much expresses the undying hatred that the south felt towards sherman right which still lives today and um it's sort of the Part of part and parcel of the birth of the uh, the lost cause, you know, the this abiding sense that the South um, should not forget the these, you know, its defeat. Um, so let's just go stanza through stanza. Some comments there. So the can yeah. I can I ask a historical clarification question? Yeah. Uh, what. Uh, what constituted the the justification for the turn in strategy were to to the scorched earth campaign uh, of Sherman? Because my familiarity with a lot of lot of the battles so far is that generally 
both sides were very respectful of private property. And then we get this situation where, sh where I don't think that's, I mean, that, <laughs> that was the, um, what was the general idea, but I think there was violated repeatedly on both sides. And I mean, I think Sherman wow. recognized that he had, you know, he's famous for waging what was called total war, you know, against the civilian population. Right. So, you know, he had to break the will to fight, which meant depriving the South of its resources. I mean, the, the main goal for the armies at this, you know, before Atlanta, which was uh, at the end of the summer in 1864, Atlanta was captured. That was the gateway to the South. Before that, the, right. the mission of the, of the generals was to decimate the armies of the, of the opposite, you know, of the enemy, and then right. capture the cities, the major cities, Richmond, Atlanta. But after that, you know, Atlanta, R Richmond wasn't captured yet, but Sherman was in a position to um, deprive the South of the resources it needed to continue fighting. So um, it was uh, just a, the, the necessary next step to ensure defeat uh, now that they'd gained access to the to the you know southern um, uh, deep southern uh, um, lines of communication Atlanta had I think four railway lines so that you could send armies in all directions into the deep south and Sherman um, was there to sort of deprive the the South of the will to fight to destroy their their capacity to raise food. So you know you can't put armies on the field unless they're fed. Right. So I'm sure there's a lot of ink spilt on that particular question, but I think it's a good summation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've never asked people in the South about Sherman, but I'm sure you could dig up a few people who would bend your ear about <laughs> what a villain he was. So the first stanza here is. You know, an unnamed speaker is is saying, uh, you know, do they can they really can we let them do this to us, right? Uh, saying, you know, the oppressor's knee that grinds upon the neck. You know, that's a it's a metaphor for total subjection. You know, if your knee is on your neck, you're you're in danger of being suffocated, right? You're crushed. You know, your your windpipe, your 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 uh, carotid arteries. Um, so garments rolled in blood, scorched in cities wrapped in flame. Well, that probably refers to Atlanta. And the African, the imp, he gibbers imputing shame. So the idea is that, you know, the African slaves are, uh, you know, freaking out as though it, it imputes shame on the, the, the South, I presume, because they, um, you know, they failed to liberate their slaves and they haven't managed them effectively. So they're not really... Um, you know, obviously they're not really supporting the Southern cause very passionately at this point. Um, you know, the idea of having African slaves enlist and fight was raised, but it, it, it was only a desperate last um, gesture that didn't go anywhere. Um, so in the second stanza, there's a biblical allusion to self time avenging every woe to us the joy a lot. Which, Cis, uh, which Israel thrilled when Sisera's brow showed gaunt and showed the clot. Well, that's a, a famous scene in the Old Testament of uh, jail putting a tent peg through Sisera's, uh, a enemy general's um, forehead. She nailed this tent peg through his head as a, as a way to help the Israeli armies who were invading the Holy Land. Um, so the idea is that, you know, maybe we can res resume our identity as, as a, uh, a holy nation by killing off some of the leaders like Sisera did in the Old Testament. Um, I'm sorry, like Jael, J-A-E-L, who is the, a woman who nailed this thing through the general Sisera's brow. Um, so it's a desperate idea that they're somehow going to exact revenge on these invading armies. And the idea is on uh, stanza three, you know, these soldiers are coming from Maine, from Minnesota, you know, they're kind of aliens to our climate. And they come to a sun who's raised disowned. May it wither them as the dew. So the idea is that the sunny south 
you know, there's hoping that it will somehow wither these soldiers from the far north of Maine and Minnesota, which is a kind of desperate idea. Um, and then the idea is maybe they, the ghosts of our slain appeal of angel I victories be, uh, you know, the dead soldiers who have fought are, are, are at questioning how they can allow this to happen. Um, and uh, finally we return to the reality of the scene, which talks about burning woods, skies of brass, pillars of dust are seen. This is um, kind of va vaguely Old Testament rhetoric. You know, pillars of cloud was what led the Israelites through the deserts, uh, the divine sign. Here you have pl pillars of dust, which is the destruction of the armies coming through. A live long day, their cavalry pass. You know, the, it takes the whole day for the army to pass their, you know, what, 50, 100,000 men um, passing through uh, in Sherman's army. And um, so the last thing is, uh, we were sore deceived in awful hosts. They move like a roaring wind. Uh, have we gamed and lost, but even despair? So the idea is, yeah, let's give it, you know, we, 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 we um, gambled on this idea of secession, and we've lost, but we're never going to give up our hatred. You know, that's the one thing we'll never give up. So, that's just a representative poem from the Southern perspective, which is not very common in this in the collection. So, you want to you want to move on to uh, <clears throat> a canticle, which is a sort of religious yeah. poem, or unless you had some more comment on the. Yeah, the only thing I was going to say is, again, we see these astrotheology themes here in stanza two. Uh, to the flag we hate, the flag whose stars like planets strike us through. Uh, and I, I found that line sort of just curious as we were reading over it, like planet planets strike us yeah, through. That's astrological. The idea is planets, you know, malign planets. It's sort of Shakespearean. You find it in uh, throughout the a lot of history plays. You know, things turn out badly in wars in, in um, you know various history plays because the planets are, are working against you yeah yeah just it just it just keeps showing up so let's see what's our next one the is it, it the fortitude of the north right um well do, is it the you can do well let's do a canticle because i'm i'm doing it in the page order in the book i may i don't know if i oh canticle is okay let, let, let's see i've i've got it right here uh so let me uh, do a little recitation of it. A canical, significant of the national exaltation of enthusiasm at the close of the war. Oh, the precipice titanic of the congregated fall and the angel oceanic where the deepening thunders call and the gourd so grim and the firmamental rim multitudinously thronging the waters all converge then they sweep a down and sloping solidity of surge the nation in her impulse mysterious as the tide in emotion like an ocean moves in power not in pride and is deep in her devotion as humanity is wide thou lord of hosts victorious the confluence thou hast twined by a wondrous way and glorious, a passage thou dost find, a passage thou dost find. Hosanna to the Lord of hosts, the hosts of humankind. Stable in its baselessness, when calm is in the air, the iris half in tracelessness hovers faintly fair, fitfully assailing it, a wind from heaven blows, shivering and paling it to blankness of the snows. While incessant in renewal, the arch rekindled grows till again the gem and jewel whirl and blinding overthrows till prevailing and transcending. Lo, the glory perfect there and the contest finds an ending for repose is in the air. But the foamy, deep, unsounded and the dim and dizzy ledge and the booming roar rebounded and the gall that skims the edge the giant of the pool heaves his forehead white as wool toward the iris every climbing from the cataracts that call 
irremovable vast arras draping all the wall. The generations pouring from times of endless date in their going, in their flowing, ever form the steadfast state, and humanity is growing toward the fullness of her fate. Thou Lord of hosts victorious, fulfill the end designed by a wondrous way and glorious, a passage thou, thou dost find, a passage thou dost find. Hosanna to the Lord of hosts, the hosts of humankind. Well, that was a mouthful. Yeah. Not too bad for a dry reading, but I definitely flubbed about three <laughs> words there. <laughs> uh, so, wow, that, that's that's incredible. That That's that's one of the more song-like yeah. ones well, Canticle, we, we've, we've read here. Canticle is a, uh, a text from the Bible that was, uh, it was uh, made into a song, right? So the Psalms are the official songs of the Bible, right? The Psalms. Uh, and that's a book of the Bible. Well, canticles were other selections from the Bible that were used for liturgical purposes, for for services. And in the Anglican and Episcopal uh, service, uh, you have about twenty canticles that you can uh, that are in uh, scattered throughout the year that you can use as a poem to add to whatever your theme is. Well. The canticle uh, for uh, one of the canticles of um, the Easter season is the Song of the Sea, which was what uh, Moses sang in Exodus 15 um, when the Israelites passed through the sea through the miracle of God's intervention, right? So I think when they, in this poem when they talk about a passage thou dost find, well, the passage is, is kind of the miraculous passage through the sea for the Israelites, which is here, the victory of the north, because this poem comes right after the poem about Appomattox, uh, right? And the name, the subtitle is significant of the national exultation of enthusiasm at the close of the war. Well, that was April 9th, right? Lee surrendered on a Sunday. That was Palm Sunday. So we're in Easter week when the war is closing, right? So it's suitable that Melville chooses the idea of a canticle to celebrate the end of the war, uh, and he r implicitly refers to the canticle um, about the passage of the Red uh, through the Red Sea of the Israelites, which is in Exodus 15. It's a it's called the Song of the Sea, um, uh, but the whole idea of the poem is sort of uses the imagery as a, of a giant waterfall, and I'm I'm uh, pretty sure it's based on Niagara Falls, which was, uh, you know, the the most impressive waterfall that the, the country had. And, of course, it was a legendary place, and it was associated with this idea of the sublime, you know, some place where you, you see the gigantic power of, of, the, of nature at work, which is, of course, a, um, a, a representative of God's power. So... It's a little, um, it's a fairly complex poem because in the beginning it talks about the precipice titanic of the congregated fall. So the fall there, I think, is the fallen angels. This is not the fall of mankind so much as the fallen angels from Milton's Paradise Lost because Paradise Lost is, is sort of the running subtext of a lot of these poems in that, you know, people at the time thought of the South as rebel angels, you know, declaring their independence of the God of the Union, right, and, and, and making their own country seceding together. So they were often identified with Milton's rebel angels. So the congregated fall in the beginning is, is, is sort of the fallen angels. It also relates to the falls of, the, of Niagara Falls because you it talks about the the gorge so grim and the firmamental rim. You know, the rim is like the firmament, the sky, so that kind of gives it a, a sort of Miltonic image there that uh, the, the falls are, uh, the Niagara Falls are sort of doubling with the, with the sort of the firmament, which is, this, is the sky, the blue sky, uh, where the gods fell from. You know, this, the, in the ancient world, they actually thought the blue of the sky was because there was water up there. So, in the, right, in the, the, the uh, waters the, above the waters from the above, waters below. Exactly, in the creation, right? Um, God separated the two waters. 
So at the end, though, all these waters are pouring down, and then they're converging uh, together, which I think embodies the idea that this river of humanity is finally coming together again uh, as a united uh, country. You know, the South is going to give up its, its attempt to secede. So, you know, in the second stanza, he talks about the the nation in her impulse mysterious as the tide in emotion like an ocean moves in power not in pride and is deep in her devotion as humanity is wide. So the idea is that the whole country, everyone is kind of moving this, this sort of the whole of humanity is moving like a, this mysterious tide of emotion and, and, and seawater. Um, of course the main poem, the main purpose of the poem is to give thanks to God, you know. Um, I mean, thanksgivings were a regular feature of the Civil War. And in fact, the first official thanksgiving as a national holiday was instituted in in the fall of 1863 um, after uh, a, a series of Union victories, right? So, the thanking of, the, of God is... Um, is is pretty much the reason this poem exists, um, and the thankfulness is uh, identified with the passage through the Red Sea because he's he's talking about a passage thou dost find, Hosanna to the Lord of Hosts, the hosts of humankind. So the Lord of Hosts, of course, is one name for the Old Testament God. You know, the hosts are are the battle, uh, the warrior angels who who travel around God. You know. And the hosts of humankind, of course, are the Union troops. Um, so, Hosanna, it's interesting, that word only appears in the Bible once in the New Testament. It was the word that the Israelites, or the, I'm sorry, the people in Jerusalem used to greet Jesus on Palm Sunday. So, right. Hosanna to the Lord of hosts, you know, um, Lee surrendered on Palm Sunday. So, there's an interesting chronological overlap here. Then we have the fourth stanza talking about the iris. Of, iris, of course, is the rainbow. Iris is the Greek term, but uh, the goddess of the rainbow. So we're talking about a rainbow being visible in, the, in Niagara Falls, and which is obviously something you would see all the time on a sunny day. Um, the idea is that the iris here... The rainbow is a sign of peace, just as it was after the flood, right? In Genesis 9, um, 8 or 9, uh, you know, the rainbow is the sign that God is going to use for never again destroying humanity, right? He's, he says, well, you know, with this bow in the sky, I'm going to take a vow that I'm not going to kill off everyone after this. Well, it, well it, it, the, technically, I believe, is he won't do it again by, by water. water. Okay. So we'll do it. Right. Do it by so fire. I think, I think God <laughs> at the end. Okay. Yeah. God has a, a, a he has a yeah. way out if he <laughs> wants to purify by fire. Okay, he can. Right. I won't do it with water. Yeah. So the arch, <laughs> the rainbow is there. It's a fragile little rainbow in keeping with the fragile idea of peace. Right after the, you know, after the Confederate troops are surrendered, but you still have uh, things that could go against it. In fact, Lincoln was killed a few days later, and then everyone thought, oh my God, this. South is going to rise up again and fight a guerrilla war, you know. All right, so moving on to the next uh, stanza, you have this idea of the the foamy deep unsounded, you know, the, the water at the bottom of the falls. You have this idea about the <clears throat> the giant of the pool heaves his forehead white as wool. Well, the giant of the pool is sort of a mysterious creature, but <clears throat> in the Miltonic dimension to the poem, it's pretty much the fallen Satan, because when uh, there's imagery about when he fell from heaven, Satan was immersed in some kind of liquid um, at the bottom of his fall there. Um, and his, he heaves his forehead white as wool. Um, so, I don't know, so the, uh, the satanic creature in the water there, I think is associated with the subdued south, you know, the south is defeated, but maybe at some point this monster is going to crawl out of the out of the pool, you know, uh, but we don't know for sure. Uh, so the, the the contest is between the fragile piece of the rainbow that's hovering above the falls and the 
and the the giant in the pool who might climb out and <laughs> you know destroy everything which of course is what happened after the south uh, got rid of reconstruction um mm. so then uh second to last stands a generations pouring from times of endless date so he's kind of giving a sort of a uh, big perspective here about you know life will go on after this war we can finally look ahead to the future um and humanity will, you know, is growing towards the fullness of her fate. Um, so the the country is sort of a, moving forward at this point. And the, finally, the last stanza is another salute to the Lord of Hosts, fulfilling the end designed. You know, a passage thou dost find again the pa- the allusion to the mosaic song of the sea and the idea of the Red Sea you know, giving passage to the Israelites um, through a miracle, a divine miracle. So the last couplet is a, we're pretty much repeating the same words here, Hosanna to the Lord of hosts, the hosts of humankind. So he's saluting God, but he's also saluting the armies that have won the war, you know, of of Grant and um, other generals. Uh, so can- the canticle is a is a sort of a liturgical poem celebrating the victory of the Union um, because you know both these armies were very much invested in Christianity and they you know both of the uh, the um, the armies you know uh, supported their cause invoking all kinds of divine imagery from the Bible so. Melville, as a good patriot of the North, is invoking the God of the Israelites uh, and giving thanks for the victory that has recently taken place. It's interesting how he sort of speaks about uh, the destiny of mankind. Do we have any understanding of what Melville's ideas of progress for humanity look like? Well... He's not really on record very often about talking about progress. I mean, usually he's talking about re- recurrence of, you know, cycles of history. I mean, he's... Right. Uh, so, I mean, he doesn't agree with a lot of his fellow Americans and their optimism about the future. But, I mean, he's he's cautiously optimistic on occasion, but it's not his usual stance to celebrate progress. And it's somewhat unusual here. I think it's the idea is that God has helped the country to get through this war, so we, we should be grateful to God and look forward to the human condition continuing and, you know, a f- having a future after this, because um, with the, you know, if the South had succeeded, God knows what would have happened to the country. I mean, it would have been a calamity that we would still feel the effects of today. I noticed that there's a lot of, I guess, civil war literature out there where people imagine alternate, alternate universes, universes yeah. where the, yeah, yeah. I, I, have you ever contemplated what, well, what that would have looked like? Actually, one of the most interesting ones was written, I think, by Beverly Tucker in the 1830s about you know, anticipating the Civil War and, 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 and the uh, South succeeding in secession. Um, but um, I haven't read it. I've, I've just read about mm. it. It, it. It must be a fascinating book. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, so even at that early, uh, Southerners were, were, were thinking about this. Um, it's just... Uh, you know, it, fortunately, it was held off long enough so the south or the north became so overwhelmingly powerful in their industry and their population that they were able to, you know, not make it happen. So, well, we can we can speculate about what would have happened uh, forever and yeah. ever, and I'm sure there's a lot of good and a lot of bad uh, alternative history out there on that. But we should move on to the next so one. I have uh, and I formerly a slave. Yeah, yeah. Go okay. for it, my friend. So, formerly a slave is the title of a painting. Uh, this and uh, the subtitle is an idealized portrait 
by E. Vedder. That's Eli, Elihu Vedder, who was a, a contemporary painter. Uh, in the spring exhibition of the National Academy, 1865. So this is Melville talking about a painting that he saw in uh, the National Academy of Design, which was a, uh, one of the main artist organizations at the time, and a painting of a formerly a slave, in other words, a woman who has been released from slavery through the actions of the Union Army. Uh, so here's the poem. The sufferance of a race is shown in retrospect of life, which now too late deliverance dawns upon. Yet is she not at strife? Her children's children, they shall know the good withheld from her. And so her reverie takes prophetic cheer. In spirit she sees the stir, far down the depth of thousand years, and marks the revel shine. Her dusky face is lit with sober light, sibylline yet benign. It's a nice one. He's not trying to be too clever <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, so, you know, African Americans don't really appear that often in these poems. The Melville is pretty much writing poems about the, the white armies who are fighting. This is a, a somewhat rare poem about the actual... Uh, I individuals who will benefit from the end of slavery. So this is a depiction of a, an older woman who is described as long-suffering, who is too old to you know, spend much of her life in freedom at this point, but the idea is that she's contented to be no longer a slave, but she's going to Look ahead to her children's children who will know the good that's been withheld from her, right? So it's not the immediate offspring, but it, it's Melville kind of anticipates a certain amount of time before the freed slaves are going to be able to get on their feet economically, which of course is, is what happened. Her reverie takes prophetic cheer in spirit. She sees the stir. So... She's kind of lost in thought and dreaminess, and her 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 look is imputed to have a prophetic element. Uh, seeing the stir, the far down the depth of thousand years, and marks the revel shine. So the the joyfulness of the the slaves will be indicated in future generations. Um, it's not going to be immediate. Uh, her dusky face is lit with sober light, sibylline, like the the sibyl of Cumai, right, was a famous uh, woman who uh, went into a trance and predicted, you know, it was like an oracle and, and came out with all kinds of oracular remarks. Um, so the idea is that she's like the sibyl, that she's, her look, she looks like someone who's going to be looking in the future and seeing an improvement in her her in her offspring's lives, um, you know the idea of uh, freedom for the African American was often considered to be jubilee. You know, jubilee was the freeing of slaves and debts after forty nine years in the ancient Israel, right? So it came, it got a, conflated with the idea of the millennium. You know, a per future period of holiness and freedom. Um, so it's sort of a certain amount of quiet pathos to the this a poem about a picture, which is um, a, uh, a a particular genre of poetry. You know, was um, uh, this this idea of writing poems on pictures and the the sisterhood. You know, the kinship of art between painting and poetry was something that was celebrated in the. Uh, in, in older English poetry. Um, so, um, do you have any comments on this? I mean, I just, uh, I enjoy it, the contrast from the canticle that we just read. I mean, it's, they're, they're two very different poems. Yeah. At least it seems so on, on the surface. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
I, I guess all I'm really reporting is my feelings on it. It seemed like the canicle seemed to be one that stuck out to me as one of the better ones that we've covered, but I can also see the um, artistic virtue of what Melville has done here by not overcomplicating how he wants to memorialize this particular individual. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, we're talking about this collection of poems in totality, but do you, do you, do you rank them in your mind? Do you think there are ones that are stronger than others or do you just kind of assess it as a, yeah. as a, as an mm. aggregate? Yeah. I mean, uh, Melville, this was his first published book of poetry. And I mean, there's some weak lines throughout the collection, but I, I think um, he was intentionally, you know, creating longer, complicated poems that are some of which are almost like short stories, and then there are the, the shorter memorial poems that um, are just commemorating specific topics throughout the war. I mean, I, I I think there's a, I mean, there's a uniformity of. Um, power, I think, in what he's presenting here, because he, he's just sort of looking at the war from all kinds of angles, and I mean, it's a good thing he did mention the plight of the slave, because uh, obviously if, if there weren't any African Americans in the collection, it, it would really be missing an important element, uh, since that yeah. was, you know, one of the benefits of the war, you know, really the reason the war was fought. Ultimately, what 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 we've been doing here for those that are following along is that you know, Doctor Cook and I have been selecting poems based on our aesthetic interests, our research interests. A lot of the times, when I select a poem, I I don't really know what I'm choosing in advance. It's it's coordinating with this Civil War project that I mentioned earlier, or or a place that I've been. So there's not a lot of rhyme or reason <laughs> in my choices. Yeah. But do we know anything about how? Melville ordered these poems was there was there an intent with it um no because he um in his preface to the collection he talked about how he was he was writing poems as he was inspired almost like the aeolian harp you know which is a metaphor of the of the romantics right, right the winds come in different directions so it's whenever the spirit moved him uh so i mean he's commemorating some of the major events uh, so I, I think he's just pr trying to provide a very multifaceted uh, presentation on on the war because he's you know he's writing about the home front he's writing about battles he's writing about generals he's writing about um, um, you know memorial verses to dead soldiers and sailors so it's just it's really the uh, sort of encyclopedic. Uh, mm. topics that interest me in the collection, how how much he's able to cover in 150 pages. Do scholars see that as a virtue or a vice? Do they see that as they like the perspectival nature of it, or do they see it disor in a disorganized fashion? Well, I mean it's interesting because the, the Melville's Battle Pieces was panned when it came out. It was terrible. You know, people mm. couldn't read it. Really? Yeah. He, uh, he was very distraught by the reception because uh, people just thought that it was too detached from what was going on and the language was difficult and I don't know it just it gives you a sense that people's understanding of poetry at the time was was not very profound you know Whitman's battle uh, Civil War poetry went over much better so I think in the 20th century Melville it's like a horse race where Whitman you know, has been in the lead for a long time, and now Melville is coming up from behind. And for me, he's really, he's he's really uh, he's won the race because he, you know, Whitman has a variety of moods, but he doesn't. It does. It's not quite as um, just broad as Melville's, uh, you know, coverage of the war. So, I mean, that's my personal feeling about it. That's so. That's so interesting. Maybe one day we'll be able to do. Uh, we'll be able to do more of Whitman's Civil War stuff. Um, 
to get to do, do a little comparison. But there's more, more and more being published about Smevel's poetry and his Civil War poetry, especially. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, it's a lot of yeah. new writing about it. So we have um, the apparition next. Yeah, I guess so. I guess I'll, I'll read it right here. The apparition, a retrospect. Convulsions came and where the field long slept in pastoral green, a goblin mountain was upheaved. Sure, the scared sense was all deceived. Marl Glen and Slag Ravine. The unreserve of ill was there, the clinkers in her last retreat. But ere the eye could take it in, or mind could comprehension win, it sunk, and at our feet. So, then solidities a crust, the core of fire below, all may go well for many a year, but who can think without a fear of horrors that happen so? So, oh, this is... a. Uh... You know, interesting because it doesn't really seem to apply to any specific historical uh, aspect of the war, but there is, of course, the Battle of the Crater in Petersburg, July 30th, 1864. Right. So I think Melville used the idea of this explosive event, which was a disaster for the Union, of course, as a, as a, as a you know, a, a metaphor of the unpredictability of evil, you know, the it gets tied in with the idea of the uh, of an earthquake or a volcano or something, you know, coming out of the grounds, showing that you know beneath our feet there's disaster, catastrophe, evil, uh, you know, looking. Which you you can think of as the uh, a big metaphor for the Civil War itself, because you know a huge uh, historical catastrophe for the country. The you know in the 1850s, yeah, some people saw it coming, but it just um, <clears throat> it 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 just uh, appeared and you know turned into a terrible catastrophe in which 600,000 people died. Um, so either you want to, you can read it as sort of implying a commentary on the Battle of the Crater, or you could just talk about it as the apparition of the of the convulsion as just a general metaphor for the the war itself. Um, there's some imagery there that uh, is relates to geology, you know, marl and slag and clinkers. Clinkers are big, <coughs> big boulders. Um, that um, are, um, you know, a product of geological disturbances. Um, so one of the things that we know and appreciate in Melville uh, is his constant refrain, or his obsession with, you know, the activity of evil in the world, right? Human evil, natural evil, possibility of you know, cosmic evil. Um, so, you know, solidity is a crust, the core of fire below, all may go well for many years. So I, we all, we knew at that point that, you know, the earth was, you know, had a, I think they, they knew that there was, you know, a heated volcanic crust underneath. Obviously volcanoes are created by the lava coming from a, a much hotter, lower layer of the earth. Um, so the idea is that, you know, the earth that we stand on is a, um, is a crust that has a surface below it that is dangerous and creates earthquakes or volcanic eruptions. So... Uh, I mean, they would also be able to draw that if, even if, they hadn't adopted a more modern scientific understanding. They could still think of hell below their feet. Yeah, exactly. You so know, this is. I mean, they just true. using biblical concepts. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's but it's not really allude. There's no kind of theological idea of hell here. It's almost like it's a mythological realm of goblins. You know, the goblin mountain was upheaved. It's almost a, a sort of fairy tale world of evil. Um. 
So anyway, just to <clears throat> to get back to the Battle of the Crater, that uh, involved the Union besieging St. Petersburg and then digging a long tunnel. Uh, I think it was about 500 feet to go under the lines of the Confederates and plants. I think there were um, 320 kegs of gunpowder put underneath and then exploded on July 30th, 1864, and it created a huge crater. Uh, and uh, But the, 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 the whole thing was botched because the troops, Union troops who ran in, fell into the crater too. They were supposed to open a, a, uh, you know, a gap in the Confederate defenses and the Union was going to pour through it. Well, they got uh, kind of tied down and moving through the uh, chaotic um, uh, ruins of the place where the explosive had gone off. And how could they, how could they mine under the Confederates without them knowing? Well, there were suspicions, actually. The Confederates actually thought my, something might be going on, but they didn't effectively explore for uh, where the tunnel might be. I mean, they were within 20 feet. They were 20 feet below the Confederates because the tunnel went slightly upward <clears throat> as it went for, I guess, ventilation purposes. Um, and... Uh, so there was suspicion, but the, they hadn't done um, enough checking about what was going on. So it, it took, <laughs> I think it took about a month, but it turned out to be uh, a costly um, maneuver for the Union. There were, what, 3,798 3, casualties. I, I think three times as many casualties for the Union as, this, as the... Uh, as the Confederates. That is unbelievable. Yeah. That is insane. Yeah, it's considered to be one of the stupid disasters and um, the, uh, the uh, you know, there was an inquiry about it after the war. The, the Congress wanted to know what went wrong and um, I think it was Hooker who was, who was disgraced by that. Meade was in charge of the operation, but I think it was uh, uh, Hooker who, who took the blame for it, because it wasn't, they made a change of plan um, between the troops who were going to be running into the um, breach, and um, they, um, uh, you know. Has anyone have tried to, to represent this event in cinema, I think it has. It has tried, been depicted. Yeah. Um, do do you where uh, do you know well, off the top of your head? I, I think mean, people can research and find later. I mean, I I, I just want to see what this looks like. I now. think I'm like I'm imagining this massive implosion. I think in the, the the movie version of Cold Mountain, you know that movie, the book of uh, hmm. Fraser, I think his name was. Uh, yeah. I think that begins with an explosion like the Battle of the Crater. Um, wow, I'd I'd have to check, but there have been several books on it. It's it's quite a interesting episode in the uh, in the summer of 1864, which is otherwise a time of you know great progress against the Confederacy. So, should we move on to the slain collegians? We should. Let me. Let me find it's just it. An, it's, it's two poems beyond that. The apparition. Oh, okay, yeah. There we go. It's another long one. Jeez, Louise. Yeah. Well, we, we might we pages. might want to we might want to yeah we might want to close it out with this one, but we'll we'll see how it goes. Well, I think we it's a longer one. I think we do well, okay on time. Anyway, slain collegians. Sure. Uh, a poem talking about the the dead on both sides who were college students. Youth is it? Sorry. Oh, it's your you go ahead. Yeah, it's your turn. Okay, so I'll I'll start us out here on the slain collegians. Youth is the time when hearts are large and stirring wars appeal to the spirit, which appeals in turn to the blade it draws. If woman in sight and duty show. 
though made the mask of Cain, or whether it be truth's sacred cause, who can aloof remain, that shares youth's ardor, uncooled by the snow of wisdom or sordid gain? The liberal arts and nurture sweet, which give his gentleness to man, train him to honor, lend him grace, through bright examples meet. That culture which makes never wan with underminings deep, but holds the surface still, its fitting place, and so gives sunniness to the face and bravery to the heart. What troops of generous boys in happiness thus bred, Saturnians through life's tempi led, went from the north and came from the south, with golden mottoes in the mouth, to lie down midway on a bloody bed. Woe for the homes of the north, and woe for the sex, I'm sorry, seats of the south, all who felt life spring in prime and were swept by the wind of their place and time, all lavish hearts on whichever side of birth or bane or courage wide, arm them for the stirring wars, arm them, some to die, Apollo-like in pride, each would say, slay his python, caught the maxims in his temple taught, <clears throat> aflame with sympathies whose blaze perforce enwrapped him, social laws, friendship and kin in bygone days, vows, kisses every heart on moors and launches into the seas of wars. What could they else, north or south? Each went forth with blessings given by priests and mothers in the name of heaven, and honor in all was chief. Ward one for right and one for wrong? So put it. But they both were young, each grape to his cluster clung, all their elegies are sung. The anguish of maternal hearts must search for balm divine, but well the striplings bore their faded parts, the heavens all parts assign. Never felt life's care or cloy, each bloomed and died an unabated boy, nor dreamed what death was, thought it mere sliding into some vernal sphere. They knew the joy, but leaped the grief, like plants that flower, ere comes the leaf, which storms lay low in kindly doom, and kill them in their flush of bloom. Oh, wow. Well. So, elegy on dead college students who fought in the war, you know, saying... In the end, they kind of did themselves a favor because they, they were in their youth, they were um, in their flower. And I love this oxymoron, kindly doom. Um, it makes me think of the famous line from Menander, he whom the gods loves, uh, the gods love dies young. Famous classical right idea that you know the gods love those who die young they they are um, um, you know given a special privilege to be dead at that at that age so just to go through the poem a little bit um, it, it sort of raises the idea that the you know this use of the south and north are equally sort of innocent coming to fighting the war because they had to. They, they're women folk in sight and their duty calls them, <clears throat> even though they're going to be killing their brother, right? Though made the mask of Cain, right? Duty is calling them, but it's, it's, the, it's the job of Cain, you know, kill your brother in war. Um, so he is, the poet is celebrating the liberal arts as imparting this wonderful um, wisdom and knowledge to them, giving them gentleness, right? Teaching them to, to be gentle men, literally. Um, and that is the, the effect of going to college, of course, is what it, ideally what it's supposed to be. Of course, at that point, uh, not that many people went to college. It was mainly boys, right? Um, although there were a couple of women's colleges open at that point. So, the um, there's a sort of a classical um, 
tenor to the poem that you find the allusions to Tempe and um, other uh, the, other the, uh, yeah. ideas. They're Python. Uh, they're fighting the Python. Apollo, like in pride, you know, Apollo famously killed the Python in uh, <clears throat> Delphi, and uh, you know, liberated Greece from the 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 monster. Um, uh, so that's a kind of a act of a god creating civilization, and they're going to be like. Apollo, right, killing the monster of the enemy. Um, you've also, you've got here, going back to the previous stanza, you have the cult of Saturnalia with the Saturnians. Yeah, Saturnian. So, Saturn, yeah. the, the era, age of Saturn was a, a time of, um, it, it wasn't necessarily Saturnalia, but it was a time of, um, of peace and prosperity. The age of Saturn. So, um, but isn't Sa- isn't the age of Saturn often associated with with Satan? Uh, I've never heard that. I mean, maybe that was a Christian imposition, but uh, ah, that was that was my understanding oh, of it. Uh, Saturnians through Tempe. But, I think it's they. You know, they're living in a wonderful life led through Tempe, which was a, you know, a pastoral area in Greece, celebrated in pastoral poetry. Um, so, golden mottos in the mouth, you know, they're learning these wonderful Greek and Latin phrases and maxims. Um, and they're going to be coming down to lie down in a bloody bed. You know, there's a terrible falling off from the happy pastoral realm of classical studies and then lying down in the, in the bloody bed of the of the battles they're fighting um, so it's a it's a sort of a <clears throat> pathos in the idea of these youths these privileged and well-trained youths going to battle and <clears throat> being too young to really know uh, what they're getting into uh, dying without really being aware of the horrors of war um and uh you know it's each bloomed and died an unabated boy nor dreamed what death was though thought it mere sliding into some vernal sphere the idea is that you know death is just sort of going to like this happy hunting ground this place of pastoral peacefulness not something horrible like you know getting blown up by enemy fire um, so I think the the poem is pretty much celebrating the, you know this category of lost young men who were college educated, who were too young to really know what they were getting into. I mean, a lot of these soldiers, a lot of the people going to college in that time were in their you know mid teens or late teens, um, so they're still pretty young. And as I said, the I think the theme of the poem is from the classical idea of the the gods loving those who die young, you know, of classical idea. So you have any other thoughts about yeah, this? Well, I, yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm, I have a friend, I have a friend that's big into deliverance ministries and he's always talking to me about the spirit of Python is sort of being also a Christian concept. And I was kind of looking, it's not, it's not just a Greek one where Apollo is slaying the Python, but I think it has something to do with the strangulation of the, the Holy spirit. And I was just looking that up. It, I think it, it, it comes from Acts sixteen sixteen. There was a, uh, a damsel who was possessed with the spirit of divination. And I believe there's some understanding that she may have been possessed by Python I wonder if that's relevant to this at all, or <laughs> I, 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 had, I, have you had you ever heard about this Python no, in the Bible? No. no. But he's always talking to me about it. He's always telling me how he's afflicted by the spirit of Python. Yeah, and I, and it's intrigued me. I've wanted to look deeper into it. Well, it's a pretty more well-known Greek myth. You know, Apollo was was the great right, deliverer. Right, of course. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and that's how the that's how the oracle was established, right? Because that's where it happened. Right. Uh, so he's the founding father of Greek civilization in, in that story. Um, but, you know, I think that the, here it's that 
they've been reading this classical, these the, the, learning Latin and Greek in college, which was still you know the center of the curriculum, and they're they're reading all this literature, so they're they're imbibing all this lore about you know heroism from the classical world, Apollo uh, and killing Python. So was Python Python in in the Greek? Myth was Python. It was a huge snake. It was a, like a dragon, like a snake. Right, but was it threatening the oracle, or was it guarding the well, oracle? Well, there wasn't. A, there wasn't Delphi an oracle Park? there. It was. It was living in a cave, I think. And and he made. They made the oracle in the place where uh, the python was killed. Ah, okay. I I, I knew it was connected to the Delphic Oracle somehow. But I didn't know exactly what the story was. Yeah. No. Well, it's more, older, research, more research myth. for later. No, yeah, more research for later. Got to get up to date on my mythology. All right. What is next? Well, the Fortitude of the North was one that you were interested in. I, I did. I did. It's it's a it's a pretty simple one. I don't think it's uh, nearly as hard to decipher as the ones yeah. that uh, Doctor Cook has presented us. Uh. Here it goes. The fortitude of the North under the disaster of the second Manassas. They take no shame for dark defeat while prizing yet each victory won who fight for the right through all retreat, nor pause until their work is done. The Cape of storms is proof to every throw vainly against that foreland beat wild winds aloft and wilder waves below. The black cliffs gleam through rents and sleet when the livid Antarctic storm clouds glow. So, uh, just minimal background on this. Uh, this is, uh, it was fought, the second Manassas was fought in late August of 1862 in Prince William County, Virginia. It was Lee versus Pope. And it was much larger than the first battle, from what I understand. And Pope retreat, ended up retreating to Centerville, and Lee began the Maryland campaign shortly thereafter. Um, Dr. Kudai, I don't know if you want to give any more no, relevant... No, it's just that uh, this is the second time around, and the Union yeah. has flubbed it again, right? So this is a period right. of, uh, you know, the the first year of the war, of course, was was full of all these horrible reverses and it would only be at Antietam right in September 1862 that the um, you finally had a, a very um, important victory for the north which of course allowed Lincoln to start planning on writing uh, coming up with the Emancipation Proclamation for January 1st 1863 so I think that the poem what I like about it is this this powerful metaphor you know the the North has to keep fighting. It's got to stand firm, right? It can't be persuaded to to lose heart because of these 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 defeats, which are taking place <clears throat> throughout the first year. So the the metaphor, of course, is the Cape of Storms, Cape Horn, right? Which is a, a very difficult passage for sailors to go around South America and into the Pacific, right? Because you're you're uh, you're going down there, and uh, it's very very is it, rough passage. Is it Cape? Was it Cape Horn or the Cape of Good Hope in Africa? Well, I thought the Cape of I thought Cape of Storms was the was the Cape of Good Hope. Oh well, um, that's I uh, okay. So can we? You want to check it immediately? <laughs> I assumed it was. I assumed it was Horn because that's it's a metaphor in Melville's writing for a difficult, you know, ex terrible uh, ordeal. In Melville's writing, mm -hmm. he mentions it. He, he goes through it in White Jacket, right? The uh, the book he wrote about being in the Navy, um, and um, Black Cliffs and Antarctic storm clouds, right? Well, I don't, you know, in Cape of Good Hope, you're not really you're you're closer to the Antarctic in um, off of um, <clears throat> South America, I think. Well, it, it, it's, I'm just looking at the Encyclopedia Britannica and it's, a, it's, it says the, the alternate title for Cape of Good Hope is the Cape of Storms. And if I, 
Um, if I, I'll just read a paragraph here, Cape of good hope, Rocky, pr- Rocky promontory at the Southern end of Cape peninsula, Western Cape province, South Africa. It was first sighted by the Portuguese navigator Bartolomeu Dias in 1488 on his return voyage to Portugal after ascertaining the Southern limits of the African continent continent. One historical account says that Diaz named it Cape of Storms and that John II of Portugal renamed it Cape of Good Hope because its discovery was a good omen that India could be reached by sea from Europe. Other sources attribute its present name to Diaz himself. So Okay, well, here that, I, you know, I, I've uh, failed to do my homework. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say um, that. Yeah, so I... You know that is all vaguely familiar, but I, I I was kind of misled by the the idea of the Antarctic storm clouds, <clears throat> and the fact that he mentions it. There's a there's a chapter in White Jacket about going through it. But anyway, um, you know my mis- I don't think I don't think I don't think it changes the yeah, substance. Yeah, the idea of is that it is an immovable piece of land that you know the sea and the storms will not. Uh, intimidate. In other words, this this firm land is not going to be moved by the constant threat of winds and waves beating against it. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so it's a it's a pretty pretty straightforward poem, just with this main metaphor of <clears throat> of the land. Well, and, and, yeah, and if I could just elaborate on it, I think if he's talk if if the Cape of Good Hope and the or Cape of Storms is known for having for having waters that are subject to inclement water a great deal of time inevitably this whole this the south fighting the cape is utter futility it's it's vanity ultimately it's going to result in catastrophe they're continually going to be throwing themselves against themselves against this immovable object in very stormy waters so I think I think you've said that already, but maybe I maybe that just adds a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, you know, Melville, a lot of the poems are asserting that the northern cause is the right cause, and the right is immovable, right? So you know, you have God on your side because you're fighting for justice. Um, so somehow you know you're right, so you're gonna you're not gonna waver in your dedication. And that's that's Melville, you know, in his patriotic uh, persona. So, what's well, a good one, nonetheless? Should we should we uh, move on to the next one? And on uh, to an inscribed monument, uninscribed monument. Yeah. An, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So the wilderness. Um, that was, um, you know, one of the terrible battles fought outside Fredericksburg uh, in the spring, what, of 1864? Um, uh, May, May 5th through 7th of 1864. Yeah. And um, so this is a some kind of monument without any inscription, so it's just a sort of blank marker. Um, the subtitle, on one of the battlefields of the wilderness... Mm-hmm. Um, silence and solitude may hint whose home is in yon piney wood what I, though tableted, could never tell the din which here befell and striving of the multitude the iron cones and spheres of death set round me in their rust these two, if just, shall speak with more than animated breath Thou who beholdest, if thy thought not narrowed down to personal cheer, take in the import of the quiet here, the after quiet, the calm full fraught. Thou too wilt silent stand, silent as I, and lonesome as the land. So there's a real, there's a beautiful pathos to this poem because it's just saying, you know. Here's a, a little monument. It could be just a piece of wood uh, stuck in the ground saying, you know, it's, it's given in, uh, a voice. So this is a, this is a kind of um, poetic device that goes back to Greek 
elegy uh, for um, lost soldiers or people in death, you know, having, having tombs talking, tombstones um, or monuments attaining, a, having a personal voice. And of course you see it in, uh, um, you know, used in other poems, um, <clears throat> which uh, the famous collection of uh, poems about the, the, the dead people speaking um, that everyone reads in high school uh, out of the, out of the right. cemetery, um, the voices of the dead speaking to each other. Um, so this is uh, celebrating or, you know, mourning really the, the 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 dead but not with any specific bodies here just evidence of shells and um iron cones you know artillery shells spread around saying that all of this will speak you know i'm not inscribed with anything but all the scene speaks of the horrors that have taken place here and and the dead who have been had their lives taken away at this point so there, it's it's sort yeah, of a think, sublime pathos of something that is you know take a look at this and um, you will understand what it's like. Um, the silence here is the silence of 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 death. Yeah, I think it's a great summation of it. What was interesting is that I was doing a little bit of research for this poem. Is that I thought there might actually be an unmarked marker that there may be some kind of obelisk or something like that there. But I, whenever, when I was doing the research on it, when you see like in the the thirties and there are a lot of people who are erecting markers to particular men or particular regiments that fought in these, in, in these uh, wilderness battles. Uh, but some of the things that did come up in my own research and some of the photographs is that you, it's just the absolute shredding of the forest and how the many of the trees still yeah. have canister balls and things like that stuck into them and that have grown around them. Yeah. And that these are the, the, these, these are the markers. I actually, I found a photo of one of these spheres of death. That's that the tree has absorbed. It's like, it's, it's, it's one thing to read about, the the numbers of dead and the fighting and stuff like that. But when you actually see some of these war implements that were used, yeah, I know it, it, it must've been beyond, beyond ghastly. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's sort of a, a landscape you associate with world war one, you know, these, these yeah. desolate areas of Northern France. Um, yeah. What else, what else I thought was kind of cool about this poem is that, it so effectively conjures that pathos that you were speaking of that if you were to actually visit the scene of this battle, you're sort of, you're turned into the monument. It's at the very end. It says thou too wilt silent stand yeah. silent as I right. and lonesome as the land. You right. sort of become this, uh, you sort of become the memorial. You kind of shut up and stop moving and become this living statue almost as you take it all in. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that was, I thought that was interesting. I thought that I really liked what, how Melville did that. At least that was my interpretation of it. And I guess the only other thing was this, uh, this lonesome as the land. Uh, what's interesting is I, I found that there's a kind of an avant-garde new age jazz music group that has actually taken some of these poems and interpreted them into compositions, which is kind of interesting. I'm not not sure how good it is. I haven't been through the whole thing yet, but there is, there is a, a song that correlates to this poem out there on YouTube. If you want to check it out. Uh, but this lonesome, I thought was interesting word choice. The, the, I, I was like, what does lonesome land mean? I like, I, I've never really thought about lo land being lonely, but the idea of, lonesome having this double meaning of being unfriendly. And I just thought I would take a second to point that out. Cause I don't think I don't, in this day and age, I don't think a lot of people think about being lonesome, having this other meaning of also being unfriendly. I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. 
and 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 uh if anyone's interested you can find the piece of music that's associated with this um this poem it's uh by Lynette Westendorf and it looks like she is she's calling it an oratio or orochario so check that out if you can all right should we move on to the next one yeah you uh um we had Sherman's men uh who fell in the assault yeah. of Kennesaw Mountain Georgia you want to read that yeah yeah I'll do that on Sherman's men who fell in the assault of Kennesaw Mountain Georgia they said that fame her clarion dropped because great deeds were done no more that even duty knew no shining ends and glory twas a fallen star but battle can heroes and bards restore. Nay, look at Kennesaw. Perils the mailed ones never knew are lightly braved by the ragged coats of blue and gentler hearts are bared to deadlier war. So, uh, let's see here. Get a little bit of uh, some background on, on this. The From... Uh, the the battle of kennesaw mountain uh was fought on june 27th 1864 and i guess it was the most significant frontal assault launched by sherman against the army the confederate army of the tennessee under johnston and but it ended in a tactical defeat for the union forces but strategically the battle failed to deliver the result that the confederacy needed uh, namely stopping Sherman's advance to Atlanta. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, because the Atlanta campaign was going to be moving on uh, over the next few weeks um, and ultimately took the, the city. So Kennesaw yeah. Mountain, I guess it's it's in Marietta, Georgia, not far, not far from Atlanta. Um, yeah, that's part of the reason why I, I chose this. I don't, I, I'm not sure how many people know this, but I did my doctorate at university of georgia so that's that's why i sort of gravitated towards this one is that i had heard of kennesaw and and marietta had you been there before i have but just just to like the suburbs i haven't visited the i haven't visited the the place of the of the battle yeah yeah so i wasn't those were those weren't at that time uh i wasn't that interested in the civil war now i'm deeply i'm profoundly interested in it so this poem is, is is sort of celebrating the the heroism of these soldiers who are not like you know medieval mailed knights, but they are doing right. deeds that are even more brave. And uh, um, so you know it's it's it's. Um, Celebrating what was not a successful battle by showing the courage of the Union troops, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, I think I yeah. In terms of the 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 thrust of what he's trying to say here, I I think that's pretty much right. I, what I found interesting about this is uh, there's some mythological references that I didn't know about. Uh huh. Um, Specifically, uh, in the first line, they said that fame, her clarion, dropped. Uh, I there in Greek mythology, there 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 is a personification of fame. Did you know this? Yeah. I don't know. It's fame or fama or whatever. Fama, well, and fama is, I, the, is the Latin word fama. But um, yeah. yeah, I know. I'm trying to remember if there's some incident <laughs> of the. Well, what she did. Yeah. Yeah. What she was. Apparently she was uh, a daughter either of Gaia or Elpis and, but ap- apparently she would get involved in human affairs and she was a gossip and would go and spread it all around. Uh-huh. Is that about right? Well, there's the Greek and there's the Latin fa- fama. I think in right. the, in the, uh, in the Aeneid, of course, fama, the, you know, is also active. It's one of these mythological, uh, characters who is usually around up to mischief by saying yeah. things about someone that's that are not true um yeah 
So and then Clarion, Clarion. and then Clarion, and uh, yeah, I don't, you know, I use the word. I would use uh, this is a Clarion call, but just etymology uh clarion is like is is a trumpet yeah. of some sort right. which is really cool so so from what i understand fame uh is our female or fama she's often she's often portrayed as having a trumpet as having this sort of clarion right which i thought which i thought was really cool i didn't know that yeah so the idea is that you know contemporary war is not as great as the ancient war, you know, which is an interesting idea that comes up at the beginning of the Red Badge of Courage when Henry Fleming is thinking back to the when he was uh, going to school and learn reading the Iliad and the Odyssey and thinking about Homer, you know, and that the idea was that wars are kind of a thing of the past, that heroism that you need for war is something that's outdated um, and will never happen again. So... Melville is sort of turning the table saying that uh, heroism, fame can be attained on the modern battlefield. And I don't know. There's no specific reverence to what the Union troops have accomplished here uh, at Kennesaw Mountain. It could have been a specific incident that he read about um, that stimulated him to write this. Um, and... Well, it yeah, yeah. I I guess the thing that's perplexing about this and it's it's just a theme that comes up as I think more and more about the Civil War is this is we have these two sides beholden to these different ethical duties. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and just it it's this clash of irreconcilable ethical duties like of oh one's loyal to the to the ancestral vision of the founders as interpreted through federalism and other through the uh, state's rights or, or, or whatever else, and how we have this bizarre clash of poorly understood ethical duties that allows them to regain this very nebulous understanding of glory and place it back in the firmament. I, I, I say this sort of sar sarcastically because it drives me mad that this clash of ethical duties led to so much bloodshed. Well, yeah. I mean, there was <laughs> the 1850s are filled with, you know, clashes in Congress about the South wanting to spread the institution of slavery, which was no. anathema to, to the North, be partly because of their prejudice against, you know, African Americans. But anyway, well, do you want to... Uh, yeah, you know, I, well, well, I guess my yeah, I don't, I don't, and you, you're, you know, much more about those conversations. I just also, you know, and how interconnected those conversations were with the secessionist movement in the South. I just would really like to know what's what duty the Southerners really felt like they were serving. Well, the, it was the, um, the, the duty. I mean, they were the holy. Israel, you know, each side thought of themselves as a holy nation, and, and um, one of the things that the South thought about themselves that was that you know in their const constitution they included God. You know, they blamed the North for mm. excluding God from the constitution, so they were kind of trying to one up the North by calling themselves a more uh, sacred. Polit political oh, entity by putting God on their side in their constitution, uh, which wait, but we, yeah. but 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 the founding, but the founding fathers make plenty of references to God. I mean, but not they not don't say the, G, not in the constitution. They don't say Jesus, not in the constitution. In other words, we were we, we were given a secular document to, as a founding, um, um, you know, blueprint. But there is the Constitution secular. I, I feel like there's like divine imagery in it too. Well, I have, I have to revisit it. Well, you know, Declaration of Independence is a little more pays homage to God. But no, the Constitution is 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 you know that's one of the reasons the South thought that they were superior to the North was that they they were going to put God more firmly in place in their in their governmental structure. So, so they're trying to out God each other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, oh, do you want to? Do you want to? You want to stop here? We've gone about an hour or what in twenty minutes? 
Yeah, we probably should. I, I just get so carried away talking to you. Well, I I want I want to thank you, Doctor Cook. It's always a joy to spend these Sundays talking poetry with you in the Civil War. I, you know, I really look up to you as a mentor, and I, I've I've learned so much from you. And I think it obviously shows to everyone who who listens to these episodes that we record uh, how 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 much Doctor Cook has advanced my own education in regards to mythology, biblical studies, uh, American history, literature. Yeah. So, you, you, and, I, and, I, and I imagine other people feel the same way. Yeah, I'm going to Gettysburg in a, in a couple of weeks, so I'll have some uh, interesting uh, uh, experiences uh, to share at some point. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, my apologies about my mistake about the Cape of Storms. That was... A stupid error, and in, in fact, I, re, I I remember the fact that it was called Cape of Storms, but somehow I'd written down Cape Horn in my book, so I I forgot. Well, so you beat me I, on that. Well, it's not it's not it's not a competition, but I I will say one of the reasons why I really enjoy our professional relationship is that uh, it it really exposes all my blind spots. And then I go back and I do research and occasionally uh, I might be able to contribute something to the conversation. Yeah. Well, you, you so, have mightily this, the, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you so okay. much. I, I, I and uh, we'll be in touch soon and uh, I'd like to just keep going with these, but if um, we'll see how things go. Okay. So uh, thank you everybody for listening. Talk to you soon, Dr. Cook. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.